We're going to look at this morning the power of peace. And we're going to do a little bit of a spiritual health checkup. How many know we go to different places and our car gets checked up, our computers get checked up, yeah? Our phones get checked up, your finances get checked up, it's called uh, doing your taxes. <laughs> All these things have some form of check that we can see how we're doing. And God wants us to know how we're doing. Not because he doesn't know how we're doing, it's because he wants us to know how we're doing so that we can make the adjustments and be spiritually strong. Can you say amen? God's desire for every believer is to be spiritually strong. And that's irrespective of your circumstances, irrespective of your station, position in life. God's desire for you is to walk in strength, to walk in power, to walk in grace, to walk in faith, to walk in hope. Amen? So we're going to look at some things that um, I'm going to apologize in advance. I might step on some of your toes, but if anything like me, I've got no toes left to be stepped on because they've all been stepped on multiple times. But how many know it's sometimes it's good to have a checkup because we know exactly where we're at so we can make some decisions to change? Yeah? The definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing and expect different results. And so many Christians, they're bordering on being a little bit insane because they're not making any changes in their life, but they're expecting some stuff to happen in their life. And God has empowered us with His Spirit, with His Word, with His community of people to help us make those changes so that we can, we, we can walk in strength. Amen? And as you walk in strength, God's going to open up doors for you to be a strength to other people around you. As people see when you navigate through the storms of your life and you're in your boat with Jesus knowing through the storm and people see, hey, this person's going through a storm, but they're full of peace, they're full of joy, they're full of hope. Man, I'll have what she's having or he's having. And people will be drawn to the strength of your life. Not perfection. We'll be honest and we'll be vulnerable with our weaknesses, but there's a residing strength that no situation, no government, no circumstance that you face can ever be taken from you. Can you say amen? So I'm going to read a statement this morning. Jesus is alive and he's here, as we've already said, and his power is present this morning to bring to you what you need. Often it manifests in healing, in salvation, in deliverance, in freedom, but the power of the Lord is present this morning. Not because you and I necessarily are here, it's because he is here and he's promised to be with us. So we don't just come to a gathering and we just have some nice coffee and we walk away unchanged. We come to a gathering to hear from Jesus, to be encouraged and stirred so we can be empowered to live for him. Can you say amen? Now the greatest man in history is Jesus. He had no servants, yet they called him master. He had no degree, yet they called him teacher. He had no medicines, yet they called him healer. He had no army, yet kings feared him. He, had no, he won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. Come on! He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. He was buried in a tomb, yet he lives today. Do you know him? Can I ask you, do you know him? The resurrected king is alive this morning and he's brought his kingdom with him and he wants to give you his peace. You know, peace is something we don't really talk about that often, but it's so valuable. If you and I can walk in peace, we can walk in so much strength that we can walk in our destiny as people and people will be drawn to what we're living in because the world hasn't got any peace, lasting peace. They have temporary peace, temporary, a lot of temporary peace fillers, but the world doesn't have eternal peace that they can cling their soul to. Can you say amen? So today we're going to look at Jesus gives us his gift of peace. It's the power of peace. And it's uh, as we navigate through some of these scriptures, we're going to be, I'm going to ask you some questions so we can take a, a spiritual health Check up, yeah? We'll be good. So let's go to the next scripture, Philippians chapter 4. Uh, this is our text this morning. 
I've been loving reading the book of Philippians. I spent some time in the book of Hebrews. Now I'm in the book of Philippians. And you know the word is powerful. The word builds faith into our hearts, gives us strength. There's nothing like the word of God. Amen. I hope you're hungry for the word because the word will change you, transform you, give you strength. Then Paul says here in the book of Philippians, and mind you, he's writing this book in a jail cell. In a proper lockdown, not like the lockdowns we've had. I'm talking about a real lockdown where he's in chains, handcuffs, locks and stocks. And he has some moments and he writes this beautiful book and he says, You rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Now, if you get nothing else from this morning, I hope you can understand the power of praising God. When you can rejoice God in your storm, you've already got the victory. Because the storm has been sent your way to get you to stop focusing on Jesus and focusing on your storm. And you know, Peter, and we make fun of Peter the Apostle, but you know, Peter is the only man apart from Jesus to ever walk on water. And how did, you, how did Peter walk on water? He didn't look at the storm. He didn't look at his boat. He didn't look at his qualifications. He said, Jesus, if that's you, bid me to come to you. In other words, let me come to you because I'm scared on this boat. I don't want to sink. And you look like you're reigning over this storm that's about to kill us. So Jesus, I want to come where you are so I can be safe. So if that's you, Jesus, let me come to you. What does Jesus say? Peter, you're not quite there yet. Come back, pray, do some fasting, give some money to the church, go on a mission trip, and then when you've done some stuff, then you can do the impossible. Jesus said to Peter, come. And that word, one word, one syllable was enough for Jesus to do the supernatural and Peter to do the supernatural and he walked on water. But we know the story. While his eyes were on Jesus, he could do the supernatural. He could transcend gravity. He could do something that wasn't naturally possible for him to do or any other human to do as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus. But we know the story. The storms became louder and distracting to him. The Bible says he looked to the storm, he looked to the winds, and they were very boisterous, and he took his eyes off Jesus, and he began to sink. <laughs> and some of us have taken our eyes off Jesus, and we're beginning to sink. The good news is Jesus won't let you sink. Immediately, the Bible says, as Peter began to sink, Jesus reached out his hand, he said, come here, my boy, I'm going to save you. What am I saying? Storms have been sent to you to take your eyes off Jesus. They've been sent to distract you. This morning, we look at the power of peace. And it starts with rejoicing in the Lord always. Notice it says always, not just when good stuff's happening in your life. Come on, it's easy to rejoice if your football team wins, you get a pay rise, you do everything you're supposed to do that week, you do all your to-do box, you've got money in the bank, food on your table. Yeah, it's easy to rejoice, yeah? But it's not always easy to rejoice always when stuff's not happening the way you want it to happen. And that's our problem. We take our eyes off Jesus and we look at our stuff, we look at our life. I encourage you today. Rejoice in the Lord always. And just in case we didn't get it, Paul says it again. Again, I will say, rejoice. <laughs> so rejoice in the Lord always. And he like he squares it. He times it by itself and it becomes squared. So rejoice in the, all, in the Lord always squared. For those people who like maths. <laughs> ben would have laughed because Ben loves maths. But anyway, anyway. And it says, yeah, let your gentleness be known to all men. There's something about when you keep your eyes on Jesus, you become very gentle. He removes the harshness out of our life, the edges that are extremely harsh. We become very salty to live with. We become very on edge. 
we've become very temperamental because we've taken our eyes off Jesus. But we're rejoicing on Jesus, then he makes his gentleness come upon us and we're gentle to those around us. Anyway, the Lord is near, he's at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. I wish Paul would have said there, prayer and supplication with no complaining. That would have been very helpful. Because sometimes we pray, but we're not really praying, we're complaining. Anyone been there? Come on, be honest with me. You're all lying, I know that. Jesus forgives you. (laughs) With prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Let your requests be made known to God. In other words, let go of the stuff you're carrying, give Him your concerns, and watch what happens. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Can you say amen? So peace is a powerful, powerful, powerful thing we can experience, and it protects our hearts, it protects our minds, but we've got to do a bunch of stuff to get there. Peace won't happen by itself. We need to work our way into a state of peace, if you know what I'm trying to say. And we're going to look at some things today that we're going to do that. Let's turn to Isaiah 26, verse 3. It says here, you keep him in perfect peace, whose life is perfect and with no trouble. Is that what it says? You keep him in perfect peace. Check it out. What's the, what's the, what's, what's the definition of perfect? Whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So in order to live in this realm of perfect peace, it's not that we've got to do a bunch of stuff. Or sometimes we think peace is we've got to get rid of stuff and the absence of trouble is peace. No. Peace here tells us it's not the absence of stuff, it's the presence of someone in your life. Peace is the result of your mind being stayed on Jesus. Because where He is, He's full of peace. Jesus isn't stressing out right now. Oh no, the queen's died. King Charles, I don't know if he's got enough gumption to lead. What am I going to do? And there's all this strife happening, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful. But Jesus ain't freaking out in heaven. (laughs) He's sovereign. He's totally in control of everything that happens. It's hard for us to understand that because our world is in chaos. But even in the chaos, God is still in control. (laughs) Don't ask me to help you understand it because I don't understand it, but it's good to live there. Amen? I can live in peace not because I have worked everything out and understand everything perfectly because I don't. I can live in peace because I trust in someone who understands everything perfectly and has worked it all out for me already. Come on, if God has seen every single day you're ever going to live, He's already seen it. It's already existed in His mind. In the mind of eternity, every day you ever will live has already happened. Wouldn't it be wise to trust my life to Him? Because He's seen it all already. (laughs) Instead, we want to try and be in control. We want to try and rule our life. And it ends up being a disaster and a mess. But I'm going to encourage you today, even in our mess, God wants to reach out and help us. Amen? Beautiful. So spiritual health check starts with, can I ask you a serious question? Are you living in peace? Are you at peace with God? First step. If you're not at peace with God, there's no hope for any other peace. You're at peace with God. Are you at peace with yourself? Some of us are so mean to ourselves. Almost we want to punish ourselves. Because of stuff we've said or done or been involved in. No. God wants you to live in peace with Him, which results in peace with yourself, which results in the peace with your past. 
peace in your relationships, peace with stuff you don't understand. Jim, how can I make peace with something I don't understand? It's easy. You give up the right to have to understand. As long as you hold on to the right that you think God owes you an explanation for everything in your life, then you'll never walk in peace. Because God never promises an explanation for everything that happens in your life. Never. One day, it will all make sense. <laughs> but that day is not today. <laughs> and until Jesus comes back or you go to glory, it will never make sense. But we can still live in peace. Come on, this is good news. This is like a free therapy session for you. You know that? Peace for our future. Some of us think about the future and it's in turmoil and what are we going to do and grocery and petrol and interest rates and jobs and... Man, you're acting like you're running the whole thing. No. The Bible says God will never let... His righteous ones go without bread. Do you know that? Never. <laughs> God can provide for every one of our needs. And your worry and your stress doesn't add or help to the equation. You don't get to walk in His provision by stressing out about it. That's why Jesus talked a lot about worry. Do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to have all its own problems. So why are you taking out of tomorrow's problems and bringing into today? So today's got enough problems of its own. <laughs> why do you want more problems? Why do you have little faith? In other words, why aren't you trusting? Why aren't you letting go of having the right to understand and control your life? You give yourself over to the Father in heaven who doesn't let even a little sparrow, a little sparrow go without food. Why don't you take care of your needs? Oh, you of little faith? Blows me away how kind and how good God is to us. I, 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 seven billion people on the planet and he knows everything about them, loves them all the same, knows every number of hairs, he knows everything loves them completely and provides for every one of their needs and has a place ready in heaven for them, every single one of them. That's how much the Father loves you. Anyway, let's move on. Peace comes, not, uh, peace comes from a mind that is stayed on God and from a heart that trusts God. Absence of worry or fear or anxiety don't bring peace. The presence of the Father brings you peace. The Bible says in Psalm 16, in His presence there's fullness of joy. The Father will not let you down. Man will let you down. The church will let you down. Your boss will let you down. Your husband or wife will let you down. Life will let you down. But your Father in heaven will never let you down. You can depend on Him because He's faithful and true. We are safe not in looking after our own lives. We are safe in the arms of our Father in heaven. Can you say amen? Sometimes we struggle to live in peace because we're not living in the here and now. Our mind either is stuck in the past and we remember the good old days and we have this sentimental attitude on life and one day we'll be like that again and until then, woe is me. And <laughs> Snoopy liked that one. Or our, our head's in the clouds and we're living just in tomorrow and vision and worry. And, and God say, no, my mercy is on you every morning. Every morning. I've given you mercy for today, grace for today. <laughs> Live in the moment today. Enjoy. Make the most of your relationships, I tell you. Relationships can go like that. You can lose a loved one easily like this. They can move another country, pass away to be the Lord. Don't regret. Make the most of today. Jesus said, give us today our daily bread. 
today. Lord, give us today our daily bread. <laughs> Can I live in the moment, Lord? Make the most of what's happening around me. Amen. We good? So too often, um, our stress level is tied up to our circumstances. Stress is a real enemy of peace. And living in Sydney, we kind of get wound up in stress very easily. Traffic and busyness and work and commitments. And it's all winding us up, winding us up full of stress. And we come to the presence of God and He's spending a lot of the time unwinding us. <laughs> That's why sometimes we need to shout and we need to cry and we need to laugh and express because He's releasing us of stuff we're carrying. So you could be stressed right now because you're always just too busy. You're always struggling financially. You're not getting along with someone you love. It could be a number of things. But the interesting thing fact is that those situations themselves are not the cause of your stress. Circumstances are not the cause of stress in our lives. Stress is ultimately caused by our response to circumstances in life. Our response makes the world of difference. Because <laughs> somehow we buy into the thing that, you know, everything's going to be okay. And I'm here to say to you, everything will not be okay. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have lots of trouble, lots. So his solution wasn't to escape trouble, and that's what we think peace is. My definition of peace is, I need to escape trouble. I need to escape stress. I need to escape anything that's causing me stress. And there's certain things, maybe the toxic relationships, bad environments at work, stuff that, yes, you need to flee those things. But you can't flee everything in life. We can't all live in a cave or be on holidays 24-7. That's, that's false peace. Because after two weeks, you'll be bored out of your brain. Maybe three weeks. <laughs> so there is, it's not the absence of stuff. It's the presence of someone in your life that causes you to live in peace. And it's up to us to identify stress causes in our life. It's not your pastor's role. It's not your home group leader's role. It's not your spouse's role. It's no one else's role. It's your responsibility to identify stress causes in your life. And don't tolerate them. You need to be ruthless with them and eliminate them. Or ask God for grace to walk through them. Because some stress causes, the Lord will not eliminate. In His sovereignty... He works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And sometimes we need to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. In the stress, in the dark, trusting him. And that grows us and matures us. That gives us some gumption, gives us some backbone. I want Christians to have some backbone. Not at the first sign of something, they fall away. We need some foundation as Christians. We need some, you know what, I'm just gritting. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to show up. I'm going to keep doing the right thing. I'm going to keep reading my Bible. I'm going to keep sharing about Jesus. I'm going to keep living generously. I'm going to keep stepping out in faith. I'm going to keep praying for the sick. I'm going to keep teaching my children the Word of God. I'm going to keep blessing my pastors and praying for them. I'm going to pray for my leaders and King Charles and all our leaders. Not that they're necessarily good in themselves, but they need to come to Christ. Amen? But we can't do that if we don't have peace. So I didn't identify some of those things. Anyway, we're good. <laughs> I hope my passion isn't scaring you. I'm really not that scary if you come to know me. <laughs> And this is my happy face, by the way. <laughs> so we don't have to work hard at trying to get rid of every st stressful situation. We need to learn to embrace peace in the situation, in the storm. Good? Contentment is not escape from the battle, but rather an abiding peace and confidence in the midst of the battle. Come on. That's what God wants us to have. 
not this escapist mentality. Too hard, I'm out of here. Too difficult, too stressful. No. Imagine if Jesus bailed at every conflict he ever experienced. Imagine Paul bailed on every conflict he experienced. We wouldn't have the New Testament. (laughs) Amen? There's something about God's peace that helps you through life's battles. And it doesn't mean if you're facing trouble battles, it doesn't mean you're a bad Christian. It doesn't mean you've done something wrong necessarily. It just means life's happening to you. (laughs) Keep going. Having done all to stand, keep standing. Amen? We're going to walk through. We're going to ride this thing together. How we do that, we're going to learn some peace. You're, very, you're listening very intently this morning. I'm very proud of you this morning. Even though you're not saying many amens, I forgive you, but you're listening very well this morning. I'm really proud of you. Amen. All right. Colossian teaches us that the peace of Christ can be the ruler in our heart, the governing authority in our heart. Colossians 3, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. God's desire is for peace to rule your heart. Not stress, not anxiety, not worry, not frustration. So we need to learn how do we do that because it's something that I have to cooperate with. It's something that I have to choose to let it happen. It won't happen by itself. It's let the peace of Christ. So how do I let it happen? How do I make it happen? Not that I necessarily have to fabricate it, but I have to do something to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and His Word and who Jesus is so the peace of Christ can rule in my heart. And that that word rule there in the Greek is the word we get umpire from. You know what umpire is? A referee? They make decisions, don't they? So try, no try. You're out, like cricket, you're out or not out. You're on report, you're 10 in the bin, you're sent off. That's what an umpire does, right? Umpire rules. It regulates what's permissible, what's not. Well, the peace of Christ can regulate your heart to the point where it helps you decide that feeling, that stress, that emotion, it's got to get out of here. I'm not going to allow it. If I allow that in, I'm going to lose my peace. So the peace of God says, no, don't let that thought in. Send it in the bin. You're 10 in the bin, mate. (laughs) Ain't nobody got time for that. (laughs) Anyways, (laughs) so what, what, what really is the peace of Christ? John 14 says, Jesus saying, peace I leave with you. My peace, I give to you. Come on, you can't get clearer than that. Not, check it out, not as the world gives it. Yes, not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. (laughs) Jesus beautifully explains what peace is there in one beautiful sentence. The world gives peace. By removing those things that are causing your heart to be troubled. In other words, um, it's a temporary peace. Jesus said, I give you peace, but not as the world gives it to you. I give you my peace. And we're going to look at very quickly what's the difference between God's peace and and the world's peace. Okay? Jesus uh, does not give us the same peace as the world gives us. And I wonder how many of us desire and chase after the peace that the world gives us. Because the world can give you some temporary peace, but not long-lasting peace. So what is the peace of God? One thing, definitely not, it's not the absence, as we said already, the absence of trouble. Jesus reveals to us the source and the power of his peace and wants to show us how our hearts can be ruled by his peace. Peace is not something necessarily we pursue, but peace is a result of a mind that stayed on God and a heart that trusts God. Peace is not allowing 
our hearts to be troubled or afraid. It's consistently living with the perspective of the Father in every situation. It's having calmness and power to control your heart in seemingly overwhelming situations. Jesus faced storms in life because he knew the Father's perspective about that storm. Now, until you know the Father's perspective, you won't have victory over that storm to so you can have peace in it because you're going to be constantly fighting in your mind. So how do we walk in peace? We find out the Father's will, the Father's perspective. And we get His input, we get His attitude, we get His perspective on it, and we walk according to what He shows us. That's the peace He gives us. It's the gift of peace. The Holy Spirit, one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is peace. It's an abiding, knowing, calmness that overrides every other thought and emotion. And you know when you experience peace. You know it. Peace can also help you make decisions. Sometimes we need to make life decisions, but we haven't got any peace. We're so full of stress, it's hard for us to hear. It's hard for us to decipher. And I encourage people, and I've told them all these people come to me for advice of what should I do. You know, don't worry about what you should do. Settle your heart first. If your heart can be settled, if you can have peace in your heart, then you can hear clearly what the Lord says to you. Don't make a life affecting decision when you're stressed, when you're burnt out, when you're fatigued, when you're frustrated. Because you're going to be. Amen. Jesus is our Prince of Peace. Amen. And He showed us what it's like. And He showed us what living in the peace of God is like. Um, anyway, let's move on. Okay. The source of peace. No God, no peace. Now look at that. In the K-N-O-W, there's also the word no as in opposite to yes. <laughs> so if we know God, we're going to know peace. But no God in our life, no peace in our life. Does that make sense? I did a play on word. I thought it was funny and tricky when I saw it. It was sounded better in my head. <laughs> but it's a good way to us to remember stuff. So if we know God and know his perspective, know his situation, know the Father's already given us peace, then we can walk in peace. But if we don't have the Father's perspective, it's hard for us to walk in peace. Number one, peace is a person. Not the absence of stuff. Peace is coming to a person. Uh, Second Thessalonians, I think the two is missing there. It should be Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16. Now may the Lord of peace, turn to the person next to you and say, the Lord of peace. He's the Lord of peace. In other words, He's got so much peace. <laughs> he wants to give you peace. The Lord of peace himself grant you his peace at all times and in every way. <laughs> it blows me away. That God expects us and wants us to, as his children, to have his peace at all times and in every way. Well, Jim, you don't understand what I faced recently. I might not understand, but there's one who does understand, and he gives you his peace today. And that peace, this is the amplified version. It says that peace and spiritual well-being that comes to those who walk with him regardless of life's circumstances. I love that. So we can have a peace because we don't go to a situation or circumstance. It's not avoiding life because we go to a person he is the Lord of peace, and He wants to grant you His peace today. He wants to give it to you freely. My peace I give to you. Amen? You know, Jesus' favorite expression was come. Come to me. Peter, come, to the, come on the water. Come all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you more rules and more regulations. Is that what He said? And they said, come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. What's rest? Peace. Peace. He says, let the little children come to me. 
He says, come if you're thirsty. <laughs> he says, come if you're hungry. He says, how, long I, uh, uh, how I long to gather you together. Like a hen gathers the chicks. What's that coming to me? Jesus wants you to come to him. He knows you don't have what it takes to get through the storm. He's not confused about it. He knows. He knows you can't get through without him. <laughs> Stop trying to trick yourself and be stronger than what you really think you are because you haven't got what it takes to get through the storm. But Jesus has what it takes to get you through the storm. How do you have peace? You come to him. That's why we, as, as a church, we focus a lot on our relation with Christ because it's the most important thing about you. Not where you work, not what's happened in your life, not how much money you got in the bank. Those things are irrelevant to a certain degree. Helpful, but they don't affect your peace. Only if it is your relationship with Jesus. Do you go to him when you need peace? Or do you try and self-medicate I've got no peace, so I'm going to look for peace in other places. Good? You alive? Happy? <laughs> Quick story here about Jesus. <laughs> There's a story in Mark chapter 6. You don't have time to turn there, but please read it. It will bless you. Mark chapter 6. Jesus sends his disciples in a boat to cross the lake. He says, go to the other side. And Jesus goes on a mountain to pray. Some of you have been to, probably to that mountain, been to Israel. And it says, in the fourth watch of the night. You know, the fourth watch of the night is the darkest moment of the, of the night. The way that they had the time... It's between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning, the darkest part of the night. Jesus looks in the darkest part of the night, looks down on his boys on the boat and sees them straining because a storm had come over them. They're crying out for fear. They thought they're going to die. And Jesus goes to them. Jesus sees you this morning. You might be in a dark position. You might have had some stuff happen to you. You might have had people robbed out of your life, taken away. Jesus looks, he wants to come to your storm. He wants to come in your boat. He wants to come and say, peace, be still to that storm, because we're not going in our own strength, we're coming to him. Can you say amen? Number two, peace is a position. So peace is a person, we go to him. Peace is a position, we live from him. Romans 5, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace. Say we have peace with God. But there has to be something that happens first. You need to be justified, not in your own works, but in Jesus' works for you. You need to be justified. And once you're justified, once you're forgiven, you've embraced who Jesus is, you can enjoy peace with God. And it says there that we, uh, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. We stand in a position of peace and favor and grace because that is our position. Peace is a position you are to live from. How many of us live from that position? Be honest. Or how many of us live from our condition? Good? I'm already in the Father's presence. As a believer, I already have access to His peace. As a believer, I'm already justified by faith, declared righteous. As a believer, I can relinquish control, I should relinquish control, the quicker I relinquish control to Jesus, the more peaceful I will be. He's not only my saviour, he's my Lord. 
Amen? So we live out of that place. Number three, peace is a power. We call on Him. So we go to Him, we live from Him, and we call on Him. This is a story I was talking about before, Mark chapter 6. Then He arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. <laughs> Thank you, Snoopy. Peace, be still. Jesus spoke to his storm. <laughs> that freaks me out. <laughs> and the wind ceased and there was great calm. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Jesus is master and Lord over his creation <laughs> he can speak to your storm if you go to him and ask him to show you his power he can give you the words he can give you the instruction he can give you what you need to say what you need to do so that you can speak to your storm you can speak to your mountain so you can have the power of peace in your life amen some of us are waiting for jesus to speak to our storm Jesus won't speak to our storm. He wants us to speak to our storm. That's what he says to them. How is it that you have no faith? In other words, all you have to do is call out. All you have to do is speak. All you have to do is do what I've shown you to do. I'm Lord over all creation. Speak. Jesus says, speak to your mountain. Well, Jim, what happens if I speak to my storm on my mountain and nothing changes? Good question. Very good question. Keep speaking. <laughs> Amen. Keep speaking to it. One or two things will happen. The mountain, the storm will move. Or in your pursuit of faith, in your pursuit of Christ, he'll give you the resolve you need to get through the mountain, to go through the storm. One of those things will happen. But not if you give up. Not if you stop speaking. Not if you stop going to him. Not if you live in so much turmoil that you've got no peace in your life. We have to call upon his name. The battle is the Lord's and not ours. Can you say amen? amen? We're going to finish up very quickly. Very practically. I like to give us some practical things. How do we practice peace? Now, this is the spiritual health checkup. If we can get the stethoscope out, the thermometer, <laughs> all those things out spiritually, we're going to do the checkup. Yeah? Open your mouth and say, ah. No, well, you didn't do it. Do it properly. Ah. ah. You can tell I want to be a doctor, right? I was <laughs> dreamed. <laughs> number one. Test number one. There's a scripture there, Philippians 4, but we won't read it. The contentment test. How are you doing spiritually? Are you living content? <laughs> Paul says, I've learned the secret of being content in every and any situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Can you say amen? How are you doing spiritually? Are you content? I can't answer for you. You can answer. Now, that doesn't mean... We're not trusting God for breakthrough. It doesn't mean we're not believing God for a better tomorrow. It doesn't mean we, we don't have vision in our life. I'm not saying that. But Paul says, I learned the secret of being content. So no matter what happens, I'm content in Christ. Because I can do all things through Him who gives me strength. But if you're waiting for the better job, the better house, the pay increase, if you're not married, if you're waiting to be married to be content, you haven't passed the spiritual checkup. <laughs> Come on, if it's true or not. We don't have to be married to be content. And all the single people said. Or oh, I want to get kids or whatever it is that you think you need to be content. If you're making that, you're losing your peace. You're incomplete in Him. 
God's saying, no, learn to be content in me. If everything was to be taken away, are you still content in your relationship with Christ? Good test, isn't it? (laughs) So right now, no matter what station, position of life you're in, Christ can give you his peace so you can live content. Number two test is the boundary test. How are you doing with your boundaries? We cannot live in peace if we don't have healthy boundaries around us. Impossible. Impossible. We hurry, we hustle and bustle. We live sometimes with no control, no boundaries, no what the Bible calls river banks. The fruit grows on the river banks, not on, in the river. The fruit goes on the river banks. What's the river banks? Your boundaries. Where you set boundaries for your life, for your emotions, for your mental health, for your spiritual health, for your sanity. Where you set boundaries, you can live in peace. No boundaries, no peace. If you live without boundaries, then you're living in a, in a state of almost la-la land. Can I say that nicely? Because you're just trying to have peace without doing something about it. You can control your schedule. You can control your life. You can control your phone. You can control your thoughts. You can control how much time you spend with people. You can control all those areas and you can have peace. But somehow we live out of control and expect to live in peace. It's not going to happen. Your relationships need boundaries. How much time you spend with people needs to have a boundary around it. Some of us love hanging out and coffee and dinners and, and there's no boundary, so we end up not spending any time with the Lord. I'm busy. Yeah, you're busy, but you haven't set any boundaries. If you set some boundaries, you can still enjoy your life, have beautiful relationships, but make some healthy choices to live in peace. Children, if you don't set boundaries for your kids, parents know there's no peace at home. Your kids can eat anything, get up anytime, go to sleep anytime, do whatever they want, say whatever they want. And that's not a family, that's Taronga Zoo at its best. <laughs> boundaries bring peace. Next is the forgiveness test. This is a big one, big one. And we get tested probably every day in this, every day. Every day someone will say something or not say something. Someone will look at you or not look at you. Someone will ignore you or spend too much time looking at you. (laughs) You're bad. You guys are bad. I meant that purely, by the way. Anyway, let's move on. (laughs) Sometimes things don't work out in relationships. Life is too short to live in bitterness and resentment. Too short. When do you apologize? Well, if you know you've done something wrong, apologize immediately. When do I forgive? Well, if someone's hurt you, forgive immediately. Immediately. Don't wait for them to apologize to forgive them. You're holding yourself at ransom. You're putting your peace now in the hands of someone else. Because when you forgive, you let go, you can walk in peace. If you wait for someone to apologize before you forgive, then until they apologize, you're held hostage. And you're in forg- unforgiveness. All of a sudden, I give my peace to someone else. No. You forgive. Take the higher road. <laughs> How many times do we forgive, they asked Jesus. Peter thought he was kind of cool. And he says, Lord, seven times? Man, that's a lot. Seven times? And Jesus said, come on, my son. Seven times? 
No, 70 times seven times. 490 times. <laughs> ben would have liked that one as well. <laughs> well, people owe me something. No, no one owes you anything. You forgive. You forgive. Come on. And if you can't forgive, there's biblical protocols to do. So some, something's said, something's hurt. You try and forgive, but you can't. We need to talk to that person. One-on-one, -on -one, not on text, not on WhatsApp, not on FaceTime, in the flesh. Go to them. Not, don't accuse them. Don't say, how dare you treat me like that. You say language like, help me understand, when you said that, I took it this way, I got hurt. Can you understand how that happened? Don't point fingers, don't accuse, and give them a chance to explain. Don't be judge and jury before you heard the person's testimony. Hear them. Now notice the Bible doesn't say go to your pastor and tell your pastor what that person did to you. Or to go to your connect group leader. Or tell your husband or your wife. Or tell your children what all these bad people have done to little old me. No. Because all of a sudden you're polluting all those people against that person. And it's secondhand offense. So all of a sudden the people you've told carry an offense. And, but there's, nothing, there's no issue but they carry an offense. There's a reason the Bible's taught us that. Because it preserves the integrity of our relationships. And just in case you wonder, when we sit down with people, we don't talk about other people. You need to know that. What you say to us is in confidence. We don't sit there and some people think all we do is talk about them in the church. All the leaders, they all talk about me. and they all talk. No. Actually, we talk about you very little. Why am I saying that? It's helpful to understand. We need to pass the forgiveness test. Next, and we're finishing, surrender test. I told you I was going to step on some toes, yeah? <laughs> surrender test. Again, this happens every day. Is it my will, Lord, or your will? Which one am I going to choose today? <laughs> and we've, as I said before, we die once to sin. Repent from all our sins, the Bible says. He forgives us all our sins. We repent from sin once, from dead works once, but we die to self daily. Paul says, in the New Testament, in grace, I die daily. <laughs> now what's he dying to? He's dying to self. Because well, self wants to come back on the throne. Self wants to be in control. Self wants to rule. And we need to surrender, surrender to him daily. Sometimes anxiety weighs on our heart, Proverbs 12 says. But a good word cheers it up. Sometimes it's worry that we need to surrender to him. Jesus said, do not worry. Let me give you some stats about worry quickly and we're done. Less than 10% of what you worry about will ever happen. Say that again. Less than 10% of what you worry about will ever happen. But worrying robs you of 100% of peace all the time. <laughs> yeah? 10%. And we worry about it. Just no, don't, don't worry. No one goes to their deathbed thinking, I wish I worried more in life. You know what? I wasn't a very good warrior, not warrior as in soldier. I wasn't a good warrior. Gee, I wish I worried more. My life would have been so much easier and happier. No, Worry is, worrying is toxic to your system. We need to surrender. Now, what's the difference between concern and worry? Concern focuses on challenges and moves us into action. So I'm concerned about someone or something 
I can, I have a response I can do. I can be moved to action. Worry focuses on things that are beyond your control and often result in inaction. <laughs> We're so worried about everything, but there's nothing we can do about it, so we do nothing. That's worry. So don't spend your time on things you cannot control. It's fruitless. It'll cause you stress. You'll lose your peace. Focus on things you can control and God's given you authority over and let your concern be moved to action. Amen? That's how you're going to live in peace. How are we doing with our health checkup so far? Bum bum. Do we need a prescription? <laughs> Last one is control your thoughts. Big one. Someone once said, watch your thoughts, they become words. Watch your words, they become deeds. Watch your deeds, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become character. And character is everything. <laughs> God is after strong people with strong character, but it starts with our thoughts. What are we thinking about? What are we thinking about? We don't discipline ourselves. Our minds will be chaos. We need to brain our thoughts in. Now, Jim, can you control every thought? No, I can't control every thought. But I can control how I respond to every thought. Yeah? I can control what access I give that thought to my heart. And if I can do that, whew, I'm on my way to, to peace. Amen? Let me end with a story about thoughts. There was uh, some cruel friends who uh, got invited to a Bucks party. And uh, part of the prank on the Buck was that they tied him up, hands and feet. Now, don't do this ever, please. I'm not condoning this behavior. I'm just giving you the illustration. And they took him to a train track that had two tracks on it. One was a functioning track. The other one was a, a, a non-functioning track. Now, the buck didn't know, but they tied him to a train track that was unfunctioning. So there was no train ever going to go on that track. But the buck didn't know that. So he gets tied to the track, and as he's tied to the track, he can hear a train coming. And he hears the train coming. The train's coming. And he's freaking out. I'm on the track. I can't get up. And he's imagining the train... He's imagining what's going to happen to him. And the train gets closer and closer and closer and closer. And as he's about to pass him, the buck dies from a heart attack. The fear of that thing killed him. Did the train kill him? The thought of the train killed him. Your life. How do you control it? Control the thought. If you can control the thought, you'll be safe. <laughs> Don't let the, the, the sound of an ongoing tr oncoming train distract you. Keep your thoughts on him. Amen. Tragic story. I don't even know if it's real, but it's very powerful. <laughs> it served its purpose for the illustration. Let's stand to our feet. Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, let them be afraid. Let's lift our hands to heaven. Father, we thank you today, you've given us your peace. Not as the world gives it, but you give it to us as a gift. You're the Lord of peace and we receive from you today your peace to help us in our life, Lord God. Lord, we come to you because peace is a person. Lord, we do our life out of our position in Christ, Lord, because peace is a position. We come to you because you have power over our storms, because peace is a power, Lord. Help us today with the contentment, the boundary, the forgiveness, surrender, and thoughts test. Help us today be aware of what we've failed and where we've had weaknesses, Lord God. Help us today with your strength to find contentment, to set boundaries, to forgive, to surrender, and to take control of our thoughts because you are our God and we're safe in your hands, Lord. Father, we pray blessing over us this morning. 
Thank you that your peace will guard our hearts, Lord God, as we surrender to you. Father, we pray today for the fruit of peace to be so evident in our lives, Lord God, by the Holy Spirit, that we live continually in your peace. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. God bless you. Thank you for listening. Uh, we're going to do some morning tea and coffee, and then we're going to set up for lunch.